for, uh, for, we haven't talked to you about what order, so I think I'm just going to do it in the order that you're, um, that you're listed. So we have four panels. We have two medical experts, four panelists, two medical experts, a legal expert, and um, kind of a psychological, uh, somebody to help you kind of talk through some of the psychological issues um, that kind of arise in the process. So first, um, we're going to hear from Dr. Ellen, uh, Dr. Ellen, Dr. Elvin Striat from the Pacific Fertility Center, uh, one of our gold sponsors. And then we're going to hear from Dr. Colin Smichael from Laurel Fertility, another one of our uh, of our sponsors. And um, actually, I think everybody is. And Deborah Wall from the Wall Group is going to um, be our legal expert, and uh, Gail Anderson from Dover Concierge. So why don't we go ahead and start with you, um, Dr. Triak? Uh, you don't have Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to start by saying, um, I mean, genuinely, how heartwarming this is for me to be here and see all of you. Um, th this is my career, and I love doing what I do, and I've done it for 30 years, but um, it's also very personal to me. When I had the first role of having some authority in San Francisco 20 years ago, I organized the first conference on colonialism and parenting to try to uh, extend the realm of acceptance and communication. And to see that it's turned into this is just wonderful. Thank you for everybody. But um, there's a lot of people that have been pioneers. That you can follow their past now, and we're learning so much more. So it's, it's wonderful. Um, the, the, the process can be daunting, but I think uh, there are so many opportunities to have assistance through this process. It really is a team of uh, many different players. You're now getting used to hearing about the different parts of this puzzle that you're going to put together. And I think I represent the medical part, and I want to get into some of that, of how we can help be some of the pieces of that team that's put together. Um, I've been doing this for a long time. Uh, IVF for 30 years, uh, ALS and brain were almost that long. Um, and the process, I think, now is being refined to a place where it's still daunting, but it is very efficient now. Success rates are the highest they've ever been. Um, and I think there are many opportunities to do it very personalized now. Um, I went through the handout that you have that this is about how do you pick a medical program. And I think that's a good list of questions that's on there. Um, to start with some of that, I think uh, I will get to, but I want to just go on the designated topics of how do you really decide uh, you know, who the egg donor is going to be and who the parts of the puzzle. I, I'm a very big supporter of gestational surrogacy. I think traditional surrogacy is, is often uh, problematic. I know Deborah will talk more about that. Um, in terms of the relationship with the donor, I think that it's really quite personal. I am very open to a secluded donor that's either anonymous or open. I am very open to a relative. You know, I've done that many times where it's the actual sister of one of the partners in a gay couple that can be the egg donor. And I think those have been very, very successful situations. Either way, we will provide the medical screening and the process. And that is very important in getting into how our medical donors are egg donors screened. Um, the PFC, we're fortunate that uh, we have our own in-house egg donor agency, and some of our patients find that very comforting. It's just one less stop, if you will, on that journey. It's sort of comforting to know that your physician that you're working with has screened those donors. It's very rigorous thing. I think out of uh, 100 donors, that potential donors that call to get into our egg donor pool, only two or three make the list. Um, and so it is important when you're looking at the agency, and we will tell you how that happens, but uh, not all agencies have their donors screened by a geneticist. We have two full-time geneticists on staff. So I think that that's also very important. To be a donor, also, you want someone who's compliant, who's trustworthy. And so a little bit of donor screening, I feel, is actually to make that happen. There are several things. You have to meet to our psychologist to get interviewed. We have to fill out their questionnaire. You know, Dr. Ryan, my partner, Grim Reaper, a lot of them get kicked out for medical issues. And then they have to pass psychological testing. And then they see me and I count their eggs make sure they're a good candidate. And then after that, they have to randomly pee in the cup for cocaine, and then they get tested for HIV. And so they have to be compliant to make all those visits and show up. And there's no real lie detector test, but it's kind of built in. If they say they don't smoke pot, and we find cannabis on their urine sample, guess what? I don't really care if they're smoking pot that much. It's not good for their eggs. 
But I think we've, we've caught them being dishonest. They're not going to be a donor in our pool. So you should have some confidence that the donor agency you're working with follows these guidelines. It's going to at least protect you from the medical part. So you can really focus on picking a donor that you have that gut reaction to. Um, I think anonymous versus not is, uh, in the moment, anonymous donor is sometimes usually easier emotionally because it's like getting blood out of a blood bank. It's not a real person, it's just an egg. Uh, but I think meeting the donor the long term has a lot of potential psychological benefits and also the benefits of being able to know as, as that donor's family genetically unravels. If the donor's mother gets breast cancer in 20 years and you have an established relationship, you're not going to know. So we'll get into that with you and, and talk about those pluses and minuses. So uh, screening an egg donor, I think, from a medical point of view, is pretty established and I think we do a pretty good job of that. The next question is, do I want a rookie donor or a repeat donor? Common question. In our statistics, the success rates between rookies, that means the first time through, or repeat, are essentially the same. The difference is the repeat donor does have a track record. How many eggs has she made? Has she created pregnancies and that sort of thing? And so my patients often will pick a donor and they'll have a rookie and a repeat and they'll ask me, how much do you think one's better than the other? We'll help you with that. Uh, screening the sperm, you guys, is pretty easy, actually. Uh, the testing is simple, the, the semen analysis, and the good thing about sperm nowadays is even if your sperm counts zero, when I can find a sperm someplace in your body, we're going to make it work. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and not to be silly, but to be truthful, sperm is kind of the easy part of this for us. And so, don't be too worried. We need to evaluate so we know how to help you out, but we're, we are able to do it. Um, the next thing that I think is about the um, genetic testing of embryos, this is a big thing for us. So, uh, over half our cycles now do this. We use the acronym CCS, Complete Chromosome Screening. It's basically doing the amniocentesis test your carrier will do. It's at four months pregnant. We do it on the embryo before we put it into the carrier. And it's, it's really powerful. It can cause what's called unsinking of the cycle, which means a lot of my uh, gay couples now, before they do all the investment in finding a carrier, they want to go ahead and make sure that they do have genetically normal embryos in the bank. Let's say you're using your 37-year-old sister. Well, she's got higher risk for Down syndrome. So once we get one of those genetically normal embryos, the chance of that one embryo turning into pregnancy also is well over 70%. So it can prevent problems. It can cause the cycle to be easily coordinated. You don't have to get everything lined up together. Lots of advantages there. And for better or for worse, you can select gender, which I think is an opportunity that you can either want to do or not do. We are completely open. One of the biggest decisions I think that I find difficult counseling is whether we transfer embryos one or two at a time. We really, really like to prevent twins. The data on the health of twins is just more and more scary as we go forward. And so transferring embryos one at a time and getting pregnancy rates over 70% with one is awesome. But I know how much it costs to go through a carrier, a carrier again for your second baby. It's a tough, tough decision. We will go either way with you. It's your choice. We'll try to help you. I think I'm about done, and I think the last thing I want to talk about, I was at a conference like this a few years ago with providers, parents, and children, like they just mentioned, that were big through this way. And a little 14-year-old girl was at my table, and she raised her hand, I want to tell you about the love and birth story. And uh, I forgot to hear this. And it was about how her parents told her about her birth journey. And she just blossomed. You know, we love you so much before you're here. We got these players together to make this happen. She heard it from three years old, and I think it's beautiful, and I think you'll all hopefully have that loving birth story that you'll share with your family sometime. So I'm done, and I'll be around for the rest of the day to ask questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I love ending with that story, because it's that baby at the end. Uh, so now let's hear from Dr. Dr. Um, a, a really good candidate for that uh, relationship. 
The reason for that is just that, just like not everyone's going to be an ideal um, donor, not everyone's going to be uh, an ideal surrogate. And the good thing is just that there's a lot more latitude in terms of basically selecting a surrogate just because age becomes not much of an issue. Health is an issue, so we're going to make sure that we screen for any medical diseases that may actually contribute to or complicate the pregnancy. And also reproductive history is important. Um, that make sure that the, the surrogate at least has been delivered successfully before, preferably without a cesarean section because that may complicate the pregnancy, especially when you're talking about having twins. So that's an important part of it. Some of it, um, a lot of the testing is actually related by um, the FDA, so therefore some of that testing is gonna be done. But you know the process of making sure that the place, the uterus, is gonna be an important part to screen at every screening test, wherever you go, you're going to actually have that surrogate be evaluated by either a hysterosome fingogram, or more commonly, uh, what we call a saline sonogram or sonic histogram, to make sure the cavity is clear, there's nothing that's going to basically impact the implantation of pregnancy. Um, after that, what we're going to do is to synchronize the cycle, and I agree with Dr. Shriak that, especially in terms of doing the genetic testing, um, you can actually separate those um, events in terms of basically creating the embryos, making those one that are normal, and then transferring the embryos. But many people still choose to do um, the cycle where you're creating embryos and transferring them in a fresh cycle. Um, the chance of success may or may not be as high only because you don't know as much information. So therefore, when you're transferring a single embryo, that's great um, if it's a genetically normal embryo. But the concern is right about the fact that if you actually have more than one normal embryo, and this, I realize, and I know we're not talking about the money, but cost is always a factor that contributes to it. And everybody says, I'd much rather have twins. It's a great thought, but as Dr. Shreya talked about, there's some consequences to that as well. And we want to make, you make sure you know about that part of it. Um, as far as the pregnancy rates and success, um, the pregnancy rates and success, a lot of it has to do with the eggs themselves. So as he talked about, if you're um, using an older either friend, shared relationship, or um, an older uh, relative to be the, um, the egg provider, then the chance of success may not be as high. With um, known or um, young donors, then you're gonna have a great chance of success. So therefore, that's the most important thing. So the important part of um, the, that factor, and one of the reasons why everyone looks forward to basically helping you know, couples, is just that you're the perfect candidate. Loss of sperm, sperm not an issue. Young donors, and a proven woman who's gonna get pregnant. Can't get better than that. Not as great a story as you know, the one that delivers, but one I can end up. <laughs> we're speaking up here because of uh, because we're being recorded. Um, so that was you get extra points for for going under time. That's amazing. So next we're going to hear from Deb Wald. Deb Wall is one of the, pretty much, I would say, one of two or three national experts um, to talk with us about um, kind of the legal landscape. So we're really, really fortunate to have Deb, both here in our community and especially here with us this uh, morning. Thanks. Um, and I, I could do this in two hours, and instead I'm going to try to do it in eight minutes. I just said to Dr. Michael, thank you. I'll use up his extra time. Um, so I am barely going to be able to touch on all of the things that I would like to tell you, and I will be around for the afternoon. And come, please come visit. Um, I have to say, Ron was talking about baby guarantee insurance, and I really want to know if someone offers adolescent guarantee. <laughs> um, so gay men, stand, gay men stand at the crossroads of two highly controversial and rapidly evolving areas of law. <coughs> and I'm going to try, my family sometimes calls me a Debbie Downer. <laughs> I'm going to try very hard not to be a Debbie Downer this morning. Um, but I do feel like with just a few minutes that I need to take them to tell you some of the things you need to be concerned about from a legal perspective. Um, each and every state has its own laws, both on lesbian and gay family protection and on surrogacy um, and assisted reproduction, and they do not match up. So you really have to take the time. If you're looking at an interstate situation or an international situation, because every country also has its own laws, 
You can't assume anything, basically. Um, examples, New York. New York has now become quite good, well, it's a marriage equality state. The law is actually not so good on gay parenting issues in New York, and surrogacy remains illegal. Texas is very good on assisted reproduction law, but terrible on, you know, it will be one of the last states where we get marriage equality or are offered other ways to protect our families. So again, just don't make any assumptions. You need to make sure that whatever providers you're working with, and particularly the attorneys you're working with, working with are actually paying attention. Um, and if you're working with an agency before you're working with an attorney, that they are paying attention when they're matching you with a surrogate. I've had a wonderful gay couple who I worked with who ended up matched with a surrogate in rural Kentucky. So let me just say that was not a great idea. Um, and the agency they worked with had been working with gay families for years and promoted themselves as a gay-friendly agency, and yet they matched a gay male couple with a surrogate in rural Kentucky. Um, so enough said on that. Um, honestly, 20 years ago when I started doing assisted reproduction law in the lesbian and gay community, there were, you could count us on one hand, um, the people who offered these services. Now it's amazing. Um, there's so many attorneys, there's so many programs, there's so many clinics who welcome our families and want our business. And that is a wonderful thing. And I just, again, you know, my Debbie Downer moment, um, I just need to say to you, please make sure um, people want our business, and you need to make sure that they're walking the walk as well as talking the talk. And I say that with real respect. Um, I don't mean to be rude to anyone. The reality is it's very easy at this point to think that acceptance means treating us just like everyone else. Gay men having babies can't afford to be treated just like anyone else. Because you have a particular set of medical issues and a particular set of legal issues that aren't like the heterosexual couples who come through the clinic or the program. Um, and so we need more than that. We need someone who actually understands the differences as well as respecting us as much as anyone else. Um, I also have to warn you, I spent the entire day yesterday in a closed door meeting called by the National Center for Lesbian Rights to address the, the continuing challenges with protecting parent-child relationships post-marriage equality. Um, you know, we're up to 36 states where we have marriage equality, and a lot of people think that that means we've sort of won full family acceptance in those states, and we haven't. So again, um, don't mean to be raining on parades, but just be careful. Um, I have a wall covered with baby pictures in my office. If this is the part of my job I love the most. We tried to do this conference ourselves at OFC maybe three years ago. That was about five. Five years ago. I think there were 30 people in the room, and we were so excited. So I can't even tell you how wonderful it is to see you all here today. Um, so all I want for you Just is... That is What I want for every single one of you is a safe journey and a happy ending. And so every potentially negative thing I'm saying up here is just to try to help you make sure you have a safe journey and a happy ending. Um, okay, I have to talk about international surrogacy for a minute. Not a minute, because I don't have a minute, but 35 seconds. Um, so when you're looking for a surgeon to perform major surgery, I am pretty sure you don't go find the cheapest surgeon. That is not your main concern. Not that cost isn't an issue, because of course it is, but that is not your main concern when you're going in for surgery. I ask you to take this just as serious. The cheapest program can become the most expensive program if you get halfway through and the bottom falls out. And I have been through in 20 years the programs that go out of business and leave you with a pregnant surrogate and the money gone. I have been through the gay male couple stranded in Delhi because the surrogacy program in Delhi 
transplanted the wrong embryos, and they can't prove a DNA connection to their baby, and therefore can't bring him home. So please, 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 don't just go for cheap. I'm not asking you to waste your money, but please spend it wisely. Um, okay, and with the rest of my time, I want to try to answer the most common questions I get asked, just practical legal questions. So I frequently get asked by gay male couples, do we have to be married or in a registered domestic partnership before we go through our surrogacy journey? The answer is no, in California. In California, we treat single, um, unmarried couples, married couples all the same um, for purposes of surrogacy. Um, we have statutory protection now in California. If you have a well-drafted contract in place prior to your surrogate beginning cycle medication, you have an enforceable um, contract in terms of establishing a parental relationship with the child. It protects the surrogate, it protects you. Um, so what goes into that contract, very quickly, um, you need to have um, in the contract, first of all, you need to have independent counsel for legal counsel for you and for your surrogate. She has a right to an independent lawyer of her own choosing. Um, the contract has to identify where the gametes come from, whose eggs, whose sperm. Um, it can just say an anonymous donor, or it can say both intended fathers are providing sperm, and we don't know which one ultimately will end up being the father. But you have to identify where those come from. As of 2015, so not even two weeks ago, um, the contract also has to um, spell out how the surrogate's medical care will be paid for, what insurance will be covering it, or if there is an insurance, what's the plan. Um, those are the key things. And then, of course, a valid contract has to address, not by law, but by good common sense, you have to make sure you're addressing issues around abortion and selective reduction, um, which are critical matching issues. Um, so, I guess that's it. I'll stop there. I have a book, and um, I'm out of time, and I'll be happy to answer more questions later. And so, we're, we're running, we're right on time, and our final um, expert to speak is Gail Edison, who is going to talk, uh, and who's a counselor, who's going to talk with you about some of the supports that are available and some of the things you might want to consider. Access it. Largely, I'm going to be talking about relationships. Because relationships are really key, whether that's the relationship between you and your partner, the relationship between your donor, or the relationship that you would have with your surrogate. And of course, the most important relationship is that of your relationship with you and your partner. And there are so many things that you need to think about. I mean, obviously you're here, and this is something that you're moving towards all of this. <laughs> um, but there are things that you need to think about, and some of them have been mentioned already. You know, who's going to be the buyer dad? How will you decide who's going to be the buyer dad? Um, if you're not the buyer dad, how will you feel about that? And how will you kind of work towards, you know, sort of your feelings around that? Thinking about things like um, it's going to change your relationship when you go from being two to being three, you know, three or more. And who's going to be the primary caregiver? How will you manage that? How will you manage you know, you have to have a, a nanny or you know, what are the situations that you might have to think about? Suppose when you have positive pregnancy, you find out that there's an um, an abnormality um, in pregnancy, that there's something that hasn't gone quite right with how the baby's developing. How will you manage that? You know, will you choose to terminate? What will you do? So there are a lot of things that you want to think about prior to ever going forward with creating a baby. And then, of course, part of that is that uh, you've got to remember that it's never going to be perfect timing and that there's always things that are going to come up. And the most important thing is to be talking to each other and communicating and feeling, you know, knowing that you're in this together. And that there are also resources of people that can help you. Um, so, I'm going to talk very, very briefly about co-parenting because that's something that comes up quite often, the idea of doing co-parenting. And if you're already doing co-parenting, then that would be a traditional surrogacy relationship, where in that case the, uh, the woman who's caring is also the bio mom. Um, 
I think it, it's certainly a good way, as Deborah was saying, that you know you can save a lot of money that way, but it can be very complicated because if you think about it, you know, you've got two parents that are raising you and you two love each other, but you're still gonna have differences when it comes to what you think about how you're raising your child. So if you're having a co-parenting relationship, you're multiplying that by three or four, and it can be a lot more complicated. But if you do choose to do a co-parenting situation, make sure that you get counseling both collectively as well as individually before you move forward. And also make sure that there are legal boundaries put into place. It may not seem like you need to have them, but we really should have them in place so it's very clear what everyone's role is. So um, let's talk about relationship with your donor, which generally speaking, you don't really generally have much of a relationship with the donor unless it is, say, a co-parenting sort of relationship or if you have a family member that may be involved. Um, but just remember that that can get sticky down the road. If you're sitting there at Thanksgiving, you know, like, she paying more attention to Aunt Susie, or does, you know, does she see her as being the bio mom, and do you want her to play that role? So there are a lot of things you need to think about with that. But generally speaking, most donors choose to be donors for, first, they're usually attracted by the, you know, the compensation that they'll get and say, great, I can pay off student loans. And then the other part is being able to help someone, because usually it has to be that dualistic motivation that really makes it be something that they will go forward with, because otherwise it's quite a complex process. Um, very different from sperm donation. <laughs> so, um, so at any rate, that's something that you need to think about, that your egg donor is not likely to really want to be, she doesn't want to be the mom, and she's not necessarily looking to add to her, you know, her social group. Sometimes they are very nice and might be even willing to meet either by Skype or an in-person meeting. That's something you can you know, consider if she's open to that more and more, especially in California, more and more parents are wanting to have that option to meet. And there's also identity at 18 that many donors are willing to sign up for that. So that's also something you can consider. Um, so finding your gestational surrogate, we're not gonna go into a lot of detail on that, but in terms of doing it independent, I sort of say, don't try this at home <laughs> because it really can be fraught with lots of different pitfalls. And working with an agency, you're protected and your, your surrogate's also protected because you know that they are taking care of a lot of those little details that it's gonna be a steep learning curve for you and you're not necessarily gonna be thinking about all these little details, but this is what they do day in and day out so they can really help you with that. Um, so how does this relationship work that you're gonna have with your surrogate? And you do have a very interactive relationship with your surrogate because she's choosing you as much as you're choosing her and that's something to think about. She's gonna see a profile that tells her a bit about you. Many surrogates are really open to working with gay dads. They really love that because they don't have that competition that they have with, say, working with a heterosexual couple where the woman can't carry, and so she's going through some strong grief with all of that. So quite often, there are many surrogates that really love working with gay couples because they get to be the center of attention. <laughs> um, so, but before you start you know, creating a baby, you need to think about you know, a lot of things that need to be discussed and put into contract prior to, such as, is she willing to terminate? Is she willing to have you know, a uh, select reduction? Um, is she willing to carry twins? Um, all of these are details that you really want to make sure that you've you know, banged out ahead of time so that there's no questions later on. Um, you also have to learn to let go. Learning to let go and trust that your circuit's done this before. She has children that are healthy and thriving, and that she can do it again. She may not do things exactly the way you might do them, so you want to have a good, supportive relationship with her, but you don't want to be micromanaging. You, know, you kind of want to be in communication with her, probably at least once a week, Skype, text, all of that. Good old appointments with her whenever you can, because then you get to experience your, the growth of your baby. Um, and she gets to see your joy, because that's really the reason she does all of this, is so that she can, you know, she loves being pregnant, and she likes being able to feel like she's helping you, so that she can experience that joy. So when it comes to separation at the end, and, and sort of, you know, giving up the child, for the surrogate, it's, it's not so much her giving up the child, she's doing this for you. She already has children, she doesn't really need another baby to take home. <laughs> But since you've been in regular contact with her, you also want to make sure you don't sort of pet cold turkey and you're busy with the baby and you kind of forget all about her. Kind of keep her in the loop. And the relationship you have with her in the long run, it's going to depend on the relationship you have throughout the pregnancy. Because if you have a good, close relationship, you may continue with that. Otherwise, it may just sort of be like Facebook friends and you exchange pictures maybe a couple times a year, that sort of thing. So, 
that some of the agencies or the um, uh, companies involved also have prospective parent screening. What are some things that are involved in that process? And uh, perhaps related to that is a second question of, of um, viability for older, parent, older fathers uh, in their 40s and any risks associated with that, like, like uh, autism. So I will come to you too, mental medical. Uh, I'll answer Did everybody hear the question? Maybe you can repeat the question as you're answering. So uh, I'll go backwards in terms of uh, the older. Uh, the question was, what are the screening for intended parents? And then uh, the second part of the question, what are the, what are the, the particular risks for older parents? When you're talking about a 40-year-old man being an older parent, it's probably not the same as actually a 40-year-old woman uh, basically using her eggs. So I don't think any reproductive um, specialist will ever consider a 40-year-old man old. Uh, Tony Randall was 72 when he had his, his child. So I think sperm is a factor that, as long as you can produce sperm, and unfortunately men uh, create sperm all and every day, that it's not going to be a factor that is actually going to be there as much. So therefore, that's actually one part. I don't want to steal the trouble at all. Uh, yeah, I would agree with that. The studies that are looking at issues with older, maybe the minus 16 above, are small and controversial. And not really good science yet. The first question of uh, intended parent screenings, uh, we don't have anything we call that in, in our program. I, I think we do feel that a visit with a professional psychologist is so important that we do make it required and free. Uh, we have a, an in-house psychologist that's done this for years and years, and it's a really wonderful, wonderful visit. So from a psychological point of view, we think that's important. Um, we, we strongly advise, too, if you're on the first door you walk through, that I outline all these team players that you need. So that would be with your attorney and the gestational agency and all that kind of stuff. So we do that kind of preparing of you, but there's nothing, there's no test you have to pass. Right? Was that the intent of your question? I will add that um, the, the one testing that is required um, that we do when we do provide the sperm is that we, the FDA does, and we do require some FDA testing of. Uh, Hepatitis, HIV, all those testings, and that that is mandatory for well, mandatory from those programs. I'd say. Do the or Gail, do either of you want to during the legal or psychological components that you want to add? Psychological only, just in that you know, like I said, you need to really think through everything, and so sometimes having working with a, um, a medical, I mean, a, a mental health professional can be very helpful just to help you sort of think through things that may come up because it is all going to be very new, and, it, and you do have a very steep learning curve. So that's something that you know, talking with a mental health professional is not to see if you're going to be a fit dad; it's to see that, that you just are thinking through everything that could come up so that you're more emotionally. I, I think I don't remember which doctor it was, but said that if you have sperm, they will they will find it. And, uh, uh, and I I was fortunate enough to, to see a presentation that um, where they demonstrated that, and it's really amazing the science right now and how they're able to really you know really if you have very low count that they can find those and use them. So I I do I mean I think that's a related question. You, that might be something, if that's an issue, you probably take into account when you're choosing. Um, I'm just curious about how the prenatal care works for the um, surrogate. So if she doesn't have insurance, is there provisions for your insurance to take care of it? Or do you buy a pop? Uh, how does that work? Um, the question is, how, how do we, how, what's the coverage of health insurance for the surrogate? 
So, um, talk about highly controversial and rapidly changing areas of law. Um, I'm afraid to say anything about health insurance because it'll change by next week. But the bottom line is your insurance will not cover someone else's pregnancy. Um, I have yet to find any insurance plan on behalf of intended parents that will cover the, the surrogate's pregnancy. So the issue is to make sure she has insurance. And um, that's the I mean, how to do that it keeps changing. It used to be you could just buy her an individual plan. So her own policy may cover, so hopefully your insurance has health insurance. Your surrogate has health insurance. And I say that because if she gets the flu, if she gets, you know, whatever, other than prenatal care, you want her to have access to appropriate health care. Um, but whether her insurance, which may be through her husband's employer, it may be through her own employer, it may be a private policy, and there are a gazillion of them, um, whether her insurance will cover a pregnancy that is for the purpose of surrogacy is something that is, you literally have to check each policy to figure that out. Um, and you probably need someone to help you do that. And some of the clinics know how to do that. Some of the programs do that. Some attorneys know how to do that. And then there also are some insurance brokers who are specifically trained to do that. But one way or another, she has to have insurance to cover the pregnancy. The other thing I'll say, though, which a lot of the, the programs are missing, is your insurance will cover the baby <coughs> from the moment the baby's born. And so one of the problems you have to watch out for is incompatible insurances. Because, for example, if she has Kaiser and you have Blue Shield, Kaiser will be covering the pregnancy. You're going to want the delivery to happen in a Kaiser facility. But then your baby is born in a Kaiser facility and will your insurance cover the neonatal care? So the insurance thing is a whole other complicated, I don't want to say mess, but it's kind of a mess. Um, well, and I think that this is also changing in, in the world of uh, the Affordable Care Act yeah. because if your if your surrogate does not have insurance, that is, you know, there's now there's been affordable insurance available. Right, but only during specific windows. Right. So again, it's just you know you just you right have now. to navigate yeah. that, and it's worth thinking about it in advance. And it actually I think should be a matching factor is making sure that the surrogate has insurance. You can work with. Okay, I have, um, I'm, gonna, I'm actually to go to another side of the room, I'm going to take, I have you, you with your hand up, and then I have one here. Okay. Hi, uh, my husband and I are considering using my sister as an egg donor. She's in her late 20s, and I guess I have two questions related to this. Um, what are you asking an egg donor to do physically in order to donate eggs? Like, is that painful? Am I asking my sister to do something really difficult? And also, it's easy to imagine all these you know, sticky situations that you mentioned at Thanksgiving dinner, but are there any, like, really common issues that come up with egg donors you're related to, and are there, is there anything specific you should be aware of? So I'm going to ask one of the doctors to answer the first question, and then maybe Gail, you can cover the last one. So, uh, that's actually not as uncommon a situation as you described in terms of using uh, <coughs> uh, but We'll be clear to say that we'll not be using your sperm. But to say that, you know, um, uh, what we'll do is to walk through and talk her through the process of what what comfort to discomfort she may experience, and especially since you know um, she is a relative, walk her through um, all the things that she needs to consider in her own right in terms of basically becoming a donor and providing this gift for you. And I think you know the important thing is just that um, she may tell you that she wants to donate, and then come back and tell us that well, you know, I mean, coerced into doing this. So therefore, it's a it's a complicated um, issue where we actually have you know her talk to someone independent of you, so that we know that she's actually committed and is providing a true gift, and actually has um, that in mind. Then we'll go through a lot of the, the, the medical issues that you may go through. Uh, you're right, there is some, uh, it's a minor surgical procedure, but it's a surgical procedure nonetheless, and she is going to be taking some injections to stimulate um, the, her ovaries. So she, there is some discomfort from that, but it is a relatively short period of time that she'll go through this discomfort. So most patients will actually go through that. 
Yeah, you know, wanna? Yeah, just just very briefly. I think that every case has to be kind of looked at individually, because it could be that you know you have this great relationship with your sister, and and it may wind up being just a really nice situation. But I do, like Dr. Michael said, it's really important that she get individual counseling, because what happens quite often, whether it's your sister or you know a friend that you ask to you know be part of this equation, they're really flattered. And they, they really, you know, they feel so good about being able to do something great to help you, but they haven't always thought through how they're going to feel about this in terms of their own kids, or suppose she doesn't ever have children later on. You know, how strong a role is she going to be playing in your, your child's life? So it's something where you both, you, she needs to get counseling, and then you need to get group counseling around this to make sure that the decision you're making is a good one. And yeah, now the lawyer, yeah. and now the lawyer, you need to have a contract. Yes, you do. And a lot of people say, but it's my sister. That's so weird to do a contract with my sister. And I think most of us feel like you, your sister is the one you really need a contract with. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's one of us donor who you may never meet. It's a really short period of time that things can go wrong. With your sister, you've got a lifetime ahead of you. So the con again, I mean, honestly, in 20 years doing this, I don't think I've blown up more than a few of these relationships. And when I say that, I mean they've gone through the contracting procedure and realized this isn't it. We're not on the same page, and we shouldn't do this. And they thanked me when it's happened. I mean, it doesn't happen often, but the lawyers also are going to check you on a lot of stuff, and they're going to make you go to a level of detail, and then I'll sign your names to it. And that's that process um, can really help you figure out is this a good idea. Yeah, and she'll have her own independent yes. attorney. And always. it is, it's always, I mean, I always think, I mean, so I, now I want to contract with my sister and our kids are all But, you know, it's, a lot of it is about the expectations and it makes you answer questions that you wouldn't have thought about, like like Thanksgiving, I'm sure, comes up, you know, or making decisions. And, and so it's really helpful just as a, as a tool to think through the things that you might not have, have thought through. So I think that's, that's great. Um, all right, we had two more questions. I think we have a little bit of time, and I always feel like the questions are the most. So was somebody here, you, uh, yeah. Brent. You, the right um, For Deborah, I was wondering if you could comment on the considerations for traditional versus gestational surrogacy, but I'd also be curious to hear from the other panel members on the psychological and mental impacts as well. Okay. So and I'm going to ask everyone to be brief, because we only have a couple more minutes, and I know we have one other question. So the legal considerations of uh, traditional versus gestational surrogacy. Um, so California actually passed a statute that set perimeters and guidelines and made the law clear on gestational surrogacy effective 2014, so it's a year ago. Um, and in the process of doing that in the definition section, they said this is what traditional surrogacy is, this is what gestational surrogacy is, and that's the only thing they said about traditional surrogacy. So the answer is we don't know. Um, there is no clear law on traditional surrogacy in California at this point. The only published cases involving traditional surrogacy, and you only get to publish cases when things go wrong, um, found that, the, that a traditional surrogate's a mother. That's a woman who gives birth to her own genetic offspring, and she's a mother. And so I operate from the assumption legally because um, I take things conservatively because I want you to be protected. I assume she's the mother and that I can establish paternity for the biological father before that baby's born, but if there's a partner, he'll have to adopt and we'll get her rights terminated in that adoption proceeding <coughs> and we treat it as a service. Can I say psychologically, I, it's much more difficult for a woman to separate from a child that she is genetically related to. Because I always say it's one of like very few women are sort of like, you know, emotionally involved enough to just say, oh, it's just my, you know, my egg. When she's carried and she has children of her own, and she sort of, you know, unless she's playing the role of the body in, in that child's life, it can be very difficult for her to make that separation. That said, if I could say one sentence more, there are some experienced surrogates who don't want to go through the surgery anymore. They don't want to go through the medication anymore. They would rather do it traditional. And I have seen it work, but you have to be so careful because she gets a choice that she doesn't have to be to the traditional surrogate. And I think that's the difference. If she's a repeat surrogate, she has a different perspective. And one of our parents who's going to be here this afternoon actually used a um, a gestational surrogate the first time around they had a very close relationship as a family and then in the second round for their second child she did traditional surrogacy with them so it's you know there are I think one of the things that's great is having the opportunity to, to just talk with people who have had different experiences 
Um, and I wanted to mention on this question and on the question particularly about the family members, I mentioned earlier that we have this, um, this program coming up on the 31st about how to talk with your kids about their, um, do their, their donor origins. And I think part of that, some of, those, some of that conversation will be in both ways, both with uh, sperm donors as well as uh, surrogates when you have involved a family because that's, that's not unusual. Um, I think we have one more here, and, and then we'll see if we have time. Oh, we've got lots. Um, let's see. Let's try to get a couple more in. I think we have about five more minutes. Do you have any specific recommendations about uh, uh, where you're, one is a U.S. citizen and one is a foreign national, a permanent resident, and the ability to you know travel to other countries or other places or even other states, and what your rights are or risks? Um, and, and then. As a separate question, um, you mentioned the Affordable Care Act. Are things getting better as a result of the Affordable Care Act for <laughs> surrogates to be able to get insurance at more affordable rates? Um, so citizenship status is irrelevant to anything we do in California around establishing your rights as a parent to your child. There are if there if there are immigration issues, I would be referring you to highly competent immigration counsel to help you figure that out. But um, as long as you're, I mean, the fact that you're going through surrogacy to become parents won't matter to that, hopefully. Um, you know, you'll be parents, and so your ability to travel with your child, you have to follow the rules that parents have to follow about traveling with their children, but the, there won't be different rules. Another um, country not recognizing the marriage, for example. So again, the, the issue, so I, it's a much bigger conversation and I'm not trying to minimize the immigration issues for same-sex couples, but I can't possibly do it in a minute. Um, and, and so from a surrogacy perspective, from a legal perspective, what I can tell you is if you're having your child in California, we can make sure you're both full legal parents. And then the issues about how to protect your same-sex family with children as you're traveling is a different conversation that is an important conversation that we unfortunately don't have time to have here. And, and then as far as really quickly the uh, Affordable Care Act question, I'm wondering if either on your end or if on, on either of your clinic ends, if you have uh, noticed any significant shift. Uh, have not noted any shift. How about you? Okay, um, I'm going to go with, uh, Fred, you had a quick question. Okay, so why don't I, um, I'll go with one of the, the women. Yeah. Um, in a situation where uh, there will there's a consideration of for coherence, aside from uh, the situation where there's going to be four personalities dealing with the parenting issues, will there be any difficulty in any step along this journey with four coherence? So again, very briefly, um, <laughs> until 2014. When I had, for example, a lesbian couple and a gay couple having children together, I would have to have the painful conversation with them as their lawyer. So we can do co-parenting contracts that address the what's the plan and try to set expectations and align them and the same thing we were talking about with the sister. And I strongly, strongly recommend that. But from a strictly legal perspective, I would have to have the painful conversation of pick which two of you are going to have legal rights. And I've seen it in every version. I've seen the biological parents be the one with legal rights. I've seen the lesbian couple be the ones with legal rights. I've seen the gay male couple be the ones with legal rights. Um, I've seen you know one biological parent and then the other one's partner. So I don't care what the answer is, but you had to pick two. Um, effective January 1st, 2014, California now will recognize that under rare circumstances, some children do have more than two parents and we've been given a pathway to do that legally. It's very new, and so again, it's a longer conversation, but we have the possibility now that in that situation, if it's done well, you could all four be legal parents. Which is really new, and I think California is the only state in the country it's right the now. It's the only state that has done it by statute. There's some scattered case law in other states. So I am, okay, I'm going to take one quick sure. question more, and I know there are more, and um, go ahead. So I'm probably way ahead of myself, but could you comment on the breastfeeding or um, at least providing milk? No, no, so how open are usually uh, certain mothers to it, and is it recommended? 
Um, well, it's recommended. It's great if you can, if your surrogate is, is uh, willing to pump breast milk. That's what often is the case, that you get a, a surrogate that is willing to. You, but that's something, again, that you talk to her prior in the very beginning and you have that put into the contract that she's willing to do that. And breastfeeding is usually not recommended just because it's such a hard boundary to cross. That's an incredibly intimate experience for a woman to breastfeed a baby. And I think it's asking a lot of your surrogate to be able to breastfeed and not bond with the baby. It's usually not, yeah, I was going to say, it's usually that they pump and they deliver bottles. Yeah, they're not budget. They're not <coughs> <bottles. laughs> 